Bart and Peter, welcome along to the show. It's great Thank to have you both with me. Thank um, you. Now, believe it or not, it was over 10 years ago that you were both with me in person to discuss the Gospels, talking on that occasion about the textual criticism and transmission of the Gospels. Today, we're really looking at their historical reliability. And for those who aren't familiar with you both, let's have some quick introductions. Um, Bart, welcome back to the show. Uh, you've been engaged with the Bible since you were a Christian and since you haven't been a Christian as well, because your story of faith, as it were, goes side by side with your academic journey, doesn't it? Uh, no, that's right. I, I got interested in the Bible as a teenager when I had a uh, born-again experience in high school and uh, went off to Moody Bible Institute to study the Bible and uh, continued my education uh, and um, went off to Princeton Theological Seminary eventually to study the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. And while I was there, I, I took all sorts of courses and started studying the Bible intensely in Greek and the Old Testament in Hebrew and started realizing that my earlier belief that the Bible was without any mistakes in it was just wrong. There, there are mistakes. And uh, it took me a long time to get to that point. Uh, it, I went reluctantly, but I finally got to a point where I just said the evidence is here. I mean, it, this is a contradiction of that, uh, and they both can't be true. Mm -hmm. And so it changed my, changed my understanding of the Bible. Uh, I remained a Christian for many years after that, um, but one who was more, um, had uh, not as high of a view of, of mm -hmm. Scripture. Uh, and it wasn't until maybe 25 years ago or so that I ended up leaving Christianity altogether uh, for reasons unrelated to my scholarship. Yeah. Uh, and and we've, we've actually talked to you about that as well on, on a different show back in the archives of Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But we're coming back again today to the story of the, the reliability of the Gospels. I mean, you, you're so interesting, Bart, because um, <laughs> on the one hand, you obviously are a critic at some level of, of some evangelical views of Scripture. But at the same time, you've got your critics on the so-called Jesus mythicist side because you fully endorse, obviously, that Jesus existed. Uh, and, and you've written books, obviously, in defense of that as well. Uh, yeah, no, I get it from both sides. And uh, I suppose that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you're criticized by both sides in equal measure. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, but uh, no, that's right. But, you know, the thing is, I don't I don't believe in, in toting a party line one way or the other. It's not that, you know, OK, if you're an atheist, you have to believe this. Mm. Or if you're a, if you're a Christian, you have to believe that. It's you, I think you have to you have to decide what what appears to be right based on whatever evidence you look at. And why does the person of Jesus continue to inspire such interest on both sides in, in that sense by, by people who are both dogmatically against, as it were, his existence and those who obviously want to affirm his existence down to the, the smallest detail? Yeah, it, it's an interesting phenomenon. And it's, I mean, it, it's more interesting depending which country you happen to live mm. in. I mean, in the United States, most people are interested in Jesus on one level, and a lot of places in Europe, they're, they're not. Uh, and um, but those who those who recognize the importance of Jesus historically, whether they're Christian or not, they have to realize. I mean, as you said, he's the most important figure in the history of our civilization, and so uh, of course people should be interested. Uh, it's just that some are firm believers and uh, think that Jesus is the only way to salvation, and you have to believe in him, and as long with uh, believing everything in the Bible, or you won't be saved. And other people don't look at it like that at all. They think that Jesus is just this this amazing cultural figure that we need to. Know know more about. Mm. Well, I'm looking forward to, to getting into the historical aspects of the Gospels, which obviously you've written extensively on and, and Peter J. Williams has as well. Um, Peter, welcome back to the show. It's, Good to be with you. It's round two, isn't it, uh, with, <laughs> with, with Bart opposite you. But um, you've, in a sense, been engaged with Scripture mm -hmm. on a similar way with Bart. You know, you, you're aware of all the arguments and the issues that he's come across, yet you as a Christian have retained your faith and indeed uh, have quite a strong faith. So, so what's been different, would you say, about your journey? Well, I mean, I, I th we've just had, we've had very different experiences in growing up different countries mm. and, and, and so on. I grew up in a um, Christian family and uh, was able to go to a school, a high school, where you could learn Greek and Latin. I think, I'm not sure of this, but I think I'd read the entire Greek New Testament before going to university. Wow. And then I went to university to because I wanted to be a Bible translator mm. uh, and uh, studied Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and Latin at, um, as my undergraduate degree. And when I was there, I encountered a lot of the same sort of scholarship that um, we're going to be talking about today. Mm. Um, uh, many people who knew the Bible very well, but did not believe it to be mm. authoritative. Um, and that sent me through um, a, a lot of internal questioning and doubt and uh, looking through that over time, um, what I'd say is my journey in scholarship has been a um, firming up in my faith mm. um, because I also would say that th through my experience, 
I now believe I have arguments for the truthfulness of scripture, mm. uh, which are not generally known by lay people. So that, you know, there are, uh, on one side you can say that there can be problems with scholarship that aren't known by lay people, but I think there can also be arguments mm. for truthfulness, which aren't generally known by lay people. So yeah. uh, I think it's a, um, it's been a very positive experience for me. To, to what extent as, as a scholar, <clears throat> does what you know of the scripture impact the way you approach it as, as a Christian, you know, in, in a devotional kind of way? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, scripture is is God's word. I think uh, it's one of the things about that is it makes me want to study it, mm. it harder. Um, but of course, what that does do, I think everyone's got bias. Mm. Uh, and so I'm going to be quite open about yeah. my, my bias. Um, but it does mean that I want to... Um, I'm, uh, I've got to test myself and, and, and think, how, how is someone else from another perspective going to see this? Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that any uh, argument I use in public is something that's able to be um, looked at from a number of different angles and makes sense. Um, but, you know, I, I do think we all have um, um, ways of trying to make sense of the world. Uh, and so uh, uh, for me, Christianity makes the most sense of the world mm -hmm. and obviously uh, by that I mean a Christianity which fully embraces um, the Bible as from God mm. so uh, th that to me makes more sense than any other system we can talk about that but yeah yeah I mean it, it might be interesting to touch at some point in our discussion on, on the sort of the intersection of obviously those who are treating the Bible both as a historical document and obviously as a document from which they draw mm -hmm. their faith um, but we're, we're going to really talk about the historical aspect of the Gospels we're going to be looking at them as historians in that sense well well I won't be but you guys will be as, as people who have yeah I'm, I'm, I, might, I might question that go ahead a, a little bit well I mean because we're gonna have to sometime talk about miracles and yeah, the true. relationship between miracles yeah. and history and the discipline of history yeah so uh, yeah. that may well come into it it may but it doesn't need to as far as I'm concerned because uh -huh. I'm and the miracles aren't something I'm uh, the miracles are not the reason I think the Bible is not reliable mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, we, can, we can talk about other yeah. things. But yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, look, um, we're going to try and cover things like um, how do we get these accounts in the mm -hmm. first place? What, when do we think they were written down? Uh, by whom? Um, what are some of the things within them that either give us pause for thought, um, uh, casting doubt upon their veracity, mm -hmm. or maybe give us telltale clues of that they are historically reliable? Um, so um, let's first of all just simply ask that that opening question what how, how do we get these accounts matthew mark luke and john that we typically have in our new testament um where where do you think these essentially came from bart and were they as it were you know was it a case of the winners write history as it were because that's often the the point that's often put across that these are the accounts we have perhaps these weren't the only accounts that well, were Well, they certainly weren't the only accounts. I mean, so mm. there's no uh, there's no controversy about that. I mean, the Gospel of Luke begins by the author says that there were many people who before him had written an account of the things Jesus said and did, and I think he's probably right. And he says that, um, that, that these accounts came down from eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. And so, in other words, th their accounts uh, based on what, on stories that people had passed along orally before somebody wrote them down. And Luke at least is admitting that he acknowledging that there were people before him and presumably before the others as well. So uh, the, the ultimate answer is that the stories go back to something that happened in the life of Jesus. Uh, people told the stories for a number of years. Uh, there's nothing controversial about that. In the book of Acts, people are telling stories the whole time without writing them down. They're just telling the stories that mm -hmm. they've heard. Uh, and so uh, my view is a fairly standard view, which is that the stories were in circulation for many years. Uh, before the gospel writers produced their accounts. Uh, Jesus and his disciples, of course, were Aramaic speakers in, uh, in Galilee, a rural, a rural part of Galilee, and uh, the gospels are written in Greek. Uh, and so these are, uh, these are accounts that have, have, were originally passed around probably in the native language of Palestine, but then are la later written, some decades later, by, by Greek-speaking Christians. Mm. Uh, and so ultimately they go back to, uh, to oral traditions, and uh, before the oral traditions there were, there were events that happened that these traditions are based on. Okay. And when it comes to the four that we typically have in, in our New Testaments, um, do, what, what do you say about exactly when we're likely, to, which would you say is the first, where, how long after the events of Jesus' life would you estimate that it was written and, and what do we make of, of Well, I, I don't have an unusual dating of this. I mean, mm -hmm. I basically follow the, the mainstream scholarly line, which is that Mark is probably the first gospel written sometime around the year 70 or so, probably. Um, which would put it about 
40 years, years or so 40 after the years life after of Jesus. Jesus. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's our first account that mm-hmm. we have. There were probably ones earlier, but we don't have them. Uh, Matthew, Matthew and Luke both appear to have used Mark as one of their sources. Uh, I, I can't remember if Peter actually agrees with that or not, but, but we'll there, find out. there's a lot of, I mean, there are word-for-word agreements in okay. Greek mm-hmm. uh, that, that are sustained over a long period of time. It's hard to explain that unless somebody's copying somebody mm-hmm. else or mm-hmm. copying a common source. And mm-hmm. so Matthew and Luke have those similarities between each other and with Mark. And so it's usually thought that Matthew and Luke came later than Mark. And they're normally dated to the 80s, 80, 85, something like that. So 50, 55 years after Jesus' death. And John is almost always seen as the last gospel and usually dated toward the end of the first century, say 90 or 95. So maybe 60, 65 years after Jesus' death. So, so the time gap between Jesus uh, death and the first accounts of his life are between 40 and 65 years. Okay, and um, we'll come to talking about the actual authorship of those Gospels in a moment, but where do you stand on on the dating of the Gospels? I know this is a big area in in New Testament scholarship that, that we're talking about. Well, I, I'm, I'm deliberately non-committal on the subject mm. of dating because uh, the way I'd put it is the Gospels don't come with dates on, but they do come with names on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, if we just start with Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and there, there are no, you know, there aren't early manuscripts without those names on and I don't think it's likely that four gof- gospels were each composed anonymously and then got these names on we, we can have some Talk discussion about, about that because yep. I think we're going to differ um, so then you ask yourself the question um, say with Mark and Luke if it weren't for the gospels of Mark and Luke um, the names Mark and Luke would be sort of nobodies so I can't see a reason for people to stick those names on unless those are um, authentic and then the time scale for the Gospels has to be the time scale of people who can do the things that Mark and Luke uh, did. Luke is portrayed as a companion of Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm not going to be putting it late in the first century. I'm mm-hmm. going to be uh, putting it somewhat earlier. Uh, with Matthew and John, again, uh, we can't say the dates, but if these are people who were disciples of Jesus, then it, it's going to have to be plausibly within a lifetime of of people who could be disciples of Jesus around the year 30. So um, those are the way I, I would look at it. But then I'd, I'd also say, let's look at the internal signs within uh, the Gospels. And you start saying, um, what's the level of familiarity that these mm. people have uh, with the time and place they're writing about? Um, do they know the geography? Do they, you know, when they just write about the Valley of Kidron, say, in the Gospel mm. of John, I say, okay, the, the, check you know they they know some certain amounts about uh, where things are um when they're starting to use um aramaic words or specialist um terms so the way luke will talk about he'll use dry measures and right. liquid measures which are very palestinian the seer mm-hmm. uh, the core um and the bath you know which uh, he uses in chapters 13 and 16 you know ha- what sort of knowledge does that does that mm. presuppose and i think from that you build up a sense of uh, these people either came from the land and therefore they knew this sort of stuff or they'd had very detailed conversations with people who were in the land right. or they'd followed detailed sources that mm. have been in the land that's the sort of way i'd look at it so mm. in, so in other words i i've got a different story from um the way uh, Bart puts it where I think Bart has, you know, um, uh, rural uh, peasant Ar- Aramaic speakers, big sort of gap through some time of transmission to Greek speaking writers. And I, I would want to explore um, the various stages of that, because although I would say uh, rural in one sense, you know, I would say, well, if they're hanging around Capernaum, it's one of the most densely populated, you know, um, uh, areas. Josephus says, you know, um, he may be exaggerating, mm-hmm. but that, that every village had at least 15,000 people and so on. And so we want to, you know. Peter, and, have you, you, you know the archaeological reports on Capernaum. Well, I mean, yes, but. We, so what did the archaeology tell us about the population? Well, one of the things is people do tend to ignore. Um, no, no, no. What does the archaeology actually tell well, us? Well, I'm, I'm answering that. <laughs> um, when we look at, it tells you there are 40 by 40 blocks that, you know, people have found, but it doesn't tell you how far things go when you've had two massive Roman wars. The second one in the second century, which wipes out 900 plus settlements. I mean, every stone is going to be reused as people are trying to, you know, fortify, uh, you know, things. I think there's a lot. I mean, we can talk about this more. You do know that the stones that are used in one, reused in another place can be located to the original place. I mean, this happens all the time in archaeology. So is there any evidence that Capernaum was larger than the archaeologists say it was? 
Well, I'd say is Josephus. Is Josephus. The Josephus so, says. And how reliable is Josephus when it comes to population statistics? Well, this is a really interesting thing <laughs> because Josephus, I would say, um, is you know he's a. Ri- a written source who gives quite good numbers. I mean, you know, now p- p- people people doubt doubt this, but I'd say there is a there's a major tension between archaeological numbers generally and literary numbers. The literary numbers, as you'd know, are generally far higher, aren't they? I mean, as in when when you have people who are writing who say they were there at the time, you know, you get different numbers from what you get when you ask material if archaeologists you, today. I mean, we, isn't, isn't we, that fair? Well, what, so in terms of population size, if you want to evaluate that, all you have to do is look at newspapers that report events that happened in our, our own day where you have photographs of the crowds. Uh, Trump, for example, during his inauguration claimed that there were X number of people, mm-hmm. millions of people, yeah, sure. and the photograph showed it wasn't true. Now, he, sure. he, he was there. Yeah, he could say, so. The fact that he was there doesn't show that he's right. And no. ancient ancient authors are notorious for getting them, their populations. To, so if a, if anybody's really uh, I- interested in, in looking this up, don't don't take any of our words. But just read the archaeological report. And the easiest place to do it is simply the book done by Jonathan Reed and John Dominic Crossan, uh, where they talk about the archaeology of Palestine and they lay out the, the information at a very simple level. It's not not just for it's based on scholars. It's not for scholars. And you can see but you how. How, how populated these places You've just were. said it. Ancient authors are notorious for getting it wrong. In other words... They're basing this on archaeology. They're not basing it on yeah, so what it's, authors so say. It's, it's, a question of, it's a question of method. So in other words, they tend to set aside what the literary authors of the time say about their land. They then, in the 20th and 21st century, develop material methods which they say are more reliable than the ancient authors. And I think I, I want but the to... Reason, may, may I just say one thing about yeah. The reason they do that is because different authors give different estimates that are off by unbelievable amounts yes, in sure. the antiquity. I if understand. you simply look at, for example, what Tertullian says about the population of Christians in the Roman Empire, he claims that if the Romans wipe out the Christians, there'll be nobody left to rule, that there are more Christians than pagans. Yep. This is in the year 200. Yeah, that's hyperbole. There's no way this is... <laughs> <laughs> but we, 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 we're going to have some discussion about this later yeah. on, I think, yeah. about the number of Christians that there were, because, um, you know, uh, I think Bart goes for lower numbers in the first century than I would. I, I go for pretty standard numbers, I, I, actually. I, anyway, <laughs> what what I'm establishing is that obviously you have We've a late, later dating for these for these <clears throat> accounts of Jesus' life, the Gospels. You you would go for a, a more optimistic <clears throat> earlier dating. Yeah, so I mean, I I would say you know within the lifetimes of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it doesn't have to be mm-hmm. towards the end. And I've got no problem with Jesus predicting the fall of Jerusalem before. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask about happened. this. So yeah. the fall of Jerusalem, AD seventy. This mm-hmm. is a major event in mm-hmm. in the life of Jerusalem. The destruction of the temple and of course the gospels appear to have jesus talking about the destruction of jerusalem now as Mm -hmm. i understand it that leads many scholars to think well it must have been written afterwards and this is sort of Mm -hmm. retroactively placing the destruction of jerusalem Mm -hmm. uh, on the lips of jesus but you actually believe actually that there's evidence that that the gospels were written prior to the destruction of jerusalem in in 70 AD. i I wouldn't it depends how you're coming at it okay. I'm, I'm i'm coming from a uh, tr- trying to make cohe- a coherent sense of, mm. of of everything and so in that i think there's evidence that jesus was the son of god <laughs> uh based on that i have no problem with saying he predicted things i have I, of course i don't have copies of the gospels from the year, before the year 70. so you know i'm coming it f- from the point of view of we have these documents which have all these other signs of reliability mm. that i find mm in that they portray Jesus as predicting the fall of Jerusalem. It seems to me to make sense that he predicted the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, Now, you know, uh, but that's where I do think one's belief in the supernatural or not inevitably is, is going to is a well, right, 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 right. so Bart, this yeah, is sure. this is probably a key point of difference between you. No, when no, it comes it's not to, at all. No, okay, go ahead. No, I, I agree. I, 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 I always said I thought Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem, as in before it happened. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you, so, you can have a naturalistic prediction. Yes, as well. so, it's not so naturally, it's just people make predictions. So, so in that sense, do you think it's quite possible that that, that was written down before before yes. the fall of Jerusalem? Yes. In that sense, that, well, there you go. Um, uh, I'm glad we've got some agreement. But, but, <laughs> but that, that isn't the only reason for dating the Gospels after seventy. Okay, 
So you don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to be like a secular humanist yeah. who's an atheist to think yeah. that the gospel was written after 70. It's got nothing yeah, to do with whether sure. you believe in miracles or not. I mean, I believe the, I believe the John was written in the 90s when I was a fundamentalist I, Christian. I mean, what's at stake here? Is it simply that obviously the earlier we have these gospels, the, the more likely it is that they are historically reliable? We may well agree on the, on the dating of the gospel of John. Uh, right. You know, I mean, as in there are the thought that he wrote this late on in his in a long life you mm. know uh is is it, yeah it's perfectly fine, fine for me but i would be interested on the subject of, of luke because i mean luke and acts are by the same author um the author of acts clearly knows his way around the mediterranean pretty well he's done a lot of research on the sort of localities there and wouldn't you need almost to have to have that pair of writings, you need to have someone, if they're writing in the 90s, replicate the journey that Luke is supposed to have made in the 60s to do the research in order to write the book. Um, I mean, isn't there a, a problem? Well, well, let's just spell this out then. So so what we know is that, that Luke and Acts appear to be sort of a part one and part two of, mm -hmm. of the yep. story of Jesus and then the early church and appear to have the same author um, mm -hmm. essentially writing it. Now, obviously, we attribute that to Luke traditionally, who is mentioned in the book of acts and so on um just just as a starting point what, do you have any idea yourself bart in your view who wrote luke and acts uh, i don't think we know okay um he doesn't doesn't give us his name um he uh in four places in acts he moves into the first person narrative where he says we did this we did that as somebody who uh with uh, on paul's journeys mm. and so most uh most readers have thought that this is was a companion of paul uh, because of that. Uh, there are disputes about that. The, the, the disputes are very technical and complicated. Uh, I, I spend many pages talking about it in a couple of my books, and but we probably don't want to go there now. Uh, my view is that if it was a companion of Paul, uh, that would be somebody who was not one of the companions of Jesus. Paul himself was not a companion of Jesus, and so the issue is where does Luke get his information from? Right. Uh, he doesn't say that he uh, got his information from the disciples or from anyone else. Uh, he says that people before him had written accounts, and he's done research, and now this is his, this is an accurate account. Okay. So, what's your take on what Bart's just described so, as the Genesis? So I, I think uh, we agree uh, that. Uh, the writer of Luke's gospel is not an eyewitness mm -hmm. um, hi himself. Um, and I'm very glad to hear that um, you know, Bart is open to it being a companion of Paul. It sounds like you're open to it being by well, Luke. I don't think it is, no. no. Oh, okay. But, but I'm just saying, if, the, even if it is, is even if it is, it, it's not going to change any of my views about it. My view of the historicity of the gospel of Luke has no bearing on whether it was written by a companion of Paul, because I have other reasons for thinking that it's problematic, not related to who the author was. But in in terms of the, I, I would just say, want to say from the authorship, clearly the person who's done it has done a lot of research, both around the Mediterranean, and they happen to know everything from there being sycamore trees in Jericho to, you know, the dry and uh, right. me measures, and they know about parable, um, themes yes. uh, in Palestine. They've, right. they've got this sort of knowledge. That's right. And so uh, we have to credit this author with a massive amount of, of research. Right. Um, and That's right. given, given that, I would say, given the sort of consistency with which we, um, across the, the book of Luke, um, get high levels of knowledge about the land, then you, yes. you, you know this, this works very well if you have someone like, let's say, you know, a doctor who happens to have visited Palestine and interviewed people, you know, is is that that explains what we have most easily. And, and if, uh, well, if no, not, no, 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 the most easily is the problem. It, w it would explain it. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of other things that would explain it. The reason for suspecting that Luke isn't accurate has nothing to do with whether he knows about sycamore trees or about names of people who live in Palestine. So those are not arguments that people use to say that Luke isn't accurate. Uh, the arguments being accurate have uh, have to do with other things we haven't gotten to yet. Mm -hmm. Well, wh why don't we aim to get to some of those in a very short mm -hmm. moment's time? Um, we're talking on the show today about the story of Jesus, the historical reliability of the Gospels. My guests today on The Big Conversation are Bart Ehrman and Peter J. Williams. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to The Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to The Unbelievable newsletter.
having a great conversation here on the big conversation between Peter J. Williams and Bart Ehrman today. I'm Justin Briley, uh, bringing you this conversation on can we trust the story of Jesus, looking at the historical reliability of the Gospels. Let's talk about Luke and Acts, first mm -hmm. of all, uh, Peter, because obviously Bart feels that there are, are reasons why we shouldn't necessarily trust the credibility mm -hmm. and historicity of this. Just just give us a little more detail, first of all, on, on some of the factors that you think authenticate this as being someone who knew the area, knew the people and so on. Yeah, so so when you look at the text, I'd say either the person has been, uh, you know, has lived in the land or they, they spent detailed conversations talking to people who lived in the land and i'd say that about all four gospels that they they know where the land goes up and down that you know between them they mentioned 26 town names uh they know traveling times and and, and so on when i look at um luke I, I find that there are certain um features I, I can think of four verses in a row say in luke 16 where you get you know, he's get a, a dry measure and a wet measure. And then we get the sons of light as a phrase, which is a Palestinian religious phrase, and then unrighteous mammon in the next verse. And those are four bits of language, which I would expect really reflect the, the, the land of Palestine. And so if we've got them in a row, it's because we actually have the wording somehow preserved. I look at a story like the story of the, the runaway son, the prodigal son, the two mm. sons, however you want to call it. And I don't think it's a story that's made by committee. I think it's a story which represents um, someone's thought who's been really very, very deeply into the Old Testament. Mm. They've rearranged uh, bits from the Laban Jacob narrative, from the Jacob Esau narrative. They're pulling out phrases here, there, and everywhere from the Old Testament. And it comes together. And so I had to say, well, which genius comes up with this? Am I going to have a later literary genius who comes up with a great story like this? Or am I going to say, no, Jesus is the genius, and somehow that story has basically been preserved? I then look at, say, uh, Luke chapter 19. You've got, he knows that there's toll collection uh, in Jericho. Uh, he knows there's a sycamore tree in Jericho. And then straight after that, you have this story about a nobleman going off to receive a kingdom and people revolting while that's happening and of course that's based on the story of Archelaus mm -hmm. who uh, went off uh, many years earlier to Rome to get uh, his uh, kingdom confirmed but the geographical setting implied by the context would be that you know you're, you're just coming out of Jericho and guess what there's Archelaus you know uh, the, the palace that Archelaus tried to build um, right nearby so I, I want to say all of these things come together. Now, I know there are problems. We might want to talk about mm. um, the chronology in, uh, in, in the beginning of, of, of Luke as well. But underlying this, I, I say someone has done a huge amount of research to get this together. Mm. Um, and it, I think the most obvious interpretation is that we have a lot of tradition of Jesus coming through. Okay. So, so for you, it just strikes you looking at the, the detail that's there, the local knowledge, um, the, the language and everything else, that this is someone writing close to the time of the event who knew the place, knew the, the people, was able to, to muster quite a lot of information that wouldn't have been available to someone writing in a more sort of distant or different place location uh, at a hazier time. Uh, and in that sense, as far as you're concerned, from what I'm hearing, you believe the gospel accounts should be taken as authoritative in the way that we might say you know almost beyond other historical accounts i mean people often compare and contrast you know different types of documents from the ancient world these as far as you can see are are, are very reliable when you look put them side by side with yeah others. i think i want to distinguish two sorts of argumentation mm. one is a sort of um this is what i can show on a first pass historically mm. and the other is what i might believe because i embrace the entire okay. and an entire christian system mm. and i want to distinguish those two yeah. But so quite a lot of detail there about times, places, events, language that yeah. Peter feels tie the Gospel of Luke and Acts to uh, someone who knew knew his stuff yeah. uh, uh, close to the events in that way. Um, and you say none of this really actually impacts the way in which you see actually there the, the problems that exist with, that's right. with yeah. the narrative. Yeah, no, that's right. So uh, I... Uh, I mean, we, we will have some differences on whether everything's accurate in Luke and Acts in terms of geography and such. So we'll, and we could argue those out. Those tend to be kind of technical little arguments. I should say that Peter's not arguing that necessarily it's early. 
mm-hmm. uh, as, you, as you summarized. He's, he's saying he's not committing to a date. Uh, Lukacs might be after 70, it might be 40, 50 years later. He's acknowledging that. But he's saying that, that the author's done a lot of research to come up with mm-hmm. this information. Uh, I personally don't think he did a lot of research. I mean, I think that, um, I think uh, uh, I can, we can get to my views about how it happened, but I'll say that I think that the entire argument that he's making doesn't really relate to the issue we want to discuss. Um, the reason is because if if Luke is accurate in terms of what trees were in Palestine, what customs were followed, what measurements were used, um, if he knows what cities were there and what the distances were between them, that has no bearing on the question of whether the stories he tells about Jesus are historically right. You can read a, uh, an article in tomorrow's, uh, in, in tomorrow's Guardian uh, which talks about something that happened in, uh, in London. And the author can get everything right in terms of the geography mm-hmm. and uh, the measurements and the trees and get everything right about that. But he might be completely wrong about the story he told. We're not talking about whether he's accurate about the custom. We want to know, is, is the article right? I mean, just, just as an example. Let, let me come up with a hypothetical okay. example here. So suppose uh, in 2,000 years, there's a scholar who's heard that there's a story about a debate that took place <laughs> on this radio show, Unbelievable, in Westminster. <laughs> and there's this American scholar, happens to be in England, and uh, his name's Ehrman. And he, he, he was in Wimbledon, and he took a <laughs> overground train to Vauxhall, and then he walked across uh, the, the Vauxhall Bridge, and he came to... Uh, and uh, he was going to have this debate with somebody named Pete Williams, who actually came from Cambridge. And, and he had heard this story, mm. and he wants to verify it. Mm. So he goes on an archaeological dig, and he finds there was a place called London. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a big place. And there was, a, there was a place southwest of it, Wimbledon. And there was a train line that went to a place called Vauxhall. And, oh, my God, he finds that there's somebody named Ehrman who actually had a place in Wimbledon. And... And he digs further, and he digs in Cambridge, finds there's Pete Williams. And, and, but the story, the way the story continued was mm. that before Ehrman got to the interview, there was a big explosion in Westminster that blew up the entire neighborhood, thousands of casualties because of a gas leak. And he wants to see is that, if that's true. And what mm. he finds is that every geographical marking is right. There is a Wimbledon. There is a Vauxhall. There is a Westminster. There is an Ehrman. There, he can find all mm-hmm, his facts. Mm-hmm. Is he therefore right that there was a gas leak that led to an explosion that leveled Westminster? I'm glad to say he's wrong about that. I am too. Because we're all here. But, but so yes. what, we're inter- okay. what I'm interested in, yeah. uh, what, what Peter is arguing for is that the author knew about the geography of Palestine. And we could have that argument, but mm-hmm. it's not the one that really matters to people because people don't really care that much whether they had sycamore trees there. What they really want to know is, if, if the New Testament says that Jesus did X, Y, and Z, did he do it or not? Mm. If the New Testament says that Jesus said this, did he say it or not? The fact that the author happens to know about the geography has no, no bearing on well, the question. Let, let's come back to these questions. Well, I, I, I would want ahead. to re- reply on that because I think there are two points I'd want to make. One is uh, there is there is more co- connection because the sort of things they know are non-trivial. You can't get them through reading Pliny the Elder or reading Strabo or any book. You know, So if they're from outside the land, they have to have gone to the lengths to know, I mean, Jericho's got a different climate, you get different trees, they, they, they need to know that sort of thing. And then the other issue is, in order to get the story of Jesus wrong, you'd have to have a different uh, mechanism of information. So it's like they've gone to the efforts of doing this research to get on the context right, and then you're going to say, uh, but they were casual about the stories. And for that, I think you'd need to have some sort of system of selective corruption of information mm-hmm. that that corrupts the most important stuff and leaves all the yeah. trivial stuff yeah. in place. And Got it. I'd want to know yeah. how do you do that? Okay, good. I'm, I'd like to respond okay, to that. Go ahead. For for one thing, um, uh, I don't think you have to do a lot of research if you're living in the year seventy to report about what happened in Palestine forty years earlier in terms of geography and such. Uh, the reason is because. Uh, as you yourself are saying, uh, these authors are basing their accounts on things that they've heard. The stories, everybody agrees, the stories go back to Palestine. 
not all of the stories probably, but, but, but let's just say all, they all do. Let's say all the stories go back to Palestine. That means you have an oral tradition about what happened that includes details within the stories. This is what happens in oral traditions. Mm -hmm. It's not just unusual. for It's just not the New Testament. Every oral tradition is like mm -hmm. this. You get these little details. The fact you get the details doesn't mean that the tradition itself is right. And, it, and when you say that somebody had to do a lot of research and if they got all the trivial stuff, they also got the big stuff, that's ignoring what we know about oral tradition. We know what happens in oral traditions, and what happens is you save little details that you get right, but you can get the entire story wrong. And so the question is, what is the evidence that the story is right? We haven't gotten to this a bit yet. Okay. What is the evidence that, in fact, there are problems with these stories? Uh, I think the, 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 uh, I, enjoy, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed Peter's book very much, mm. Can We Trust the Gospels? It's, it's well thought out, very smart, intelligent, with a lot of information in it. The problem I have with it is that it doesn't actually deal with the issues that scholars have pointed to as problems in the Gospels to show that they're not reliable. Okay. Let's talk about this. Um, I mean, so Bart's overall criticism here is, okay, lots of details can come through in an oral tradition. The question is, is the story that's being told true in itself? Or has it obviously changed over time and that sort of thing? What, what gives you confidence that we are not only getting the details right, but the main thrust of the story correct? So I'd want to say, I mean, one of the things uh, Bart himself has written helpfully about is uh, quoting F.C. Bartlett you know, and how uh, one of the quotations you've got is how um, names usually get corrupted within one or two repetitions of an oral tradition. So if we've got all of the geographical names plausible, all of the p personal names, we haven't even talked about that, are right for the time and place, that suggests that we've not gone through many stages of just, just before we come to that, yeah. can you just explain the personal name side? Because this is, this is another significant area and, and, so, so, and it's so worth just spelling the, the, it out. The basic argument is that when you look at the four Gospels as a whole and you look at the proportions of names that they have, the sort of different persons, um, you know, Simon is the most popular name for Jewish men in Palestine at the time, as shown from bone boxes and other things. It's also the most popular in the Gospels. Mary is the most popular female name. It's also the most popular in the Gospels. And then what you get with all of the most popular names uh, is you tend to get a disambiguate to something added like Simon Peter or Mary Magdalene. Um, and that's happening with the popular, most popular names and not with the less popular names. So, th but, so it's, it's all of these things together that I think add up to something of more substance about the nature of the tradition that we've got, that it's not mm. come through lots of steps or the telephone analogy uh, game analogy is sometimes yeah. uh, used you know I don't I don't think that um, analogy is compatible with with what we get so essentially because you feel like you, you've got these names which accord very well with historically what we would expect in that time and <laughs> place uh, it feels like it, it, it's all coming to this this point where there's there's Everything seems right about it. Why wouldn't they get the words yeah. and the story right uh, as well? Uh, uh, maybe add one more thing, which is mm. I'm not trying to prove, and I don't think I can prove, that the things go back uh, to Jesus. Rather, I'm saying the simplest hypothesis, the thing that explains the data, is positing that Jesus said these things and they come through. That, that will beautifully and simply explain things. Um, obviously, often we've only got a single witness on these things. So by some history department, you know criteria i haven't proven it you know it's not historical I, i'm asking a question rather about is it rational and rationally responsible to trust something okay. which is sometimes slightly different from history department criteria well, if that well makes that's sense. the question we're asking can we trust the story of jesus and and in that sense th th we ultimately come to this significant question do we have the words of jesus do we have the story as it happened or are we getting a sort of interpreted changed version of the story even if we have historical details oh, that's right. and, and, and set it. and my view is that names have nothing to do with the question i mean you can have uh, you can have uh, donald trump talking about um bill and hillary clinton and um about the uh about joe biden who is in the administration about you he can name all the names but he can tell a very false story. Yes. Yeah. And so the fact that he's got the names has no bearing on right. the question. Uh, do you agree at least in principle that there is good archaeological historical evidence for the accuracy of, for instance, the names matching up? Yes. And, and that kind of, so on that sense, you guys are, are, no, have, have a this. broad amount of agreement. So I think but, but the question is, he, he, is he's it true? Using, he's, yeah. use, he's using a counter argument to an argument that doesn't exist. 
In other, he's so in other, Peter. Peter's saying yes, but you know they're wrong because of this. But nobody's saying that. That isn't why anybody thinks the Gospels is inaccurate. All right, tell us why you think they are then. Um, well, well, okay. So first, I'll say. Uh, I mean, Peter. Um, I'll do it first in general terms. Then I'll okay. then I'll really hit hit sure. it. But okay. but <laughs> but in general terms, I mean, Peter uh, mentioned a scholar of oral tradition named Bartlett. So there are uh, there is massive research done on oral traditions and how they work um, by people who are interested in antiquity, people who are interested in the modern world, uh, very famous names, uh, British scholars, American scholars, Milman Perry, uh, uh, Albert Lord, uh, Walter Ong, Jack Goody, uh, Jan Van Sina, all of these people have written big books on them and they all agree that when traditions get passed along orally, even in oral cultures, where you would think you would think they'd keep everything right, because like there's no way to check it because there's no mm-hmm. writing, so you think, mm-hmm. well, they must like memorize it, or they just pass, it, they don't change it, and all of these sto- studies show that that's wrong. They do change the stories, often quite significantly. So, uh, if the Gospels are written 40, 50 years later, uh, at least. I mean, Peter's agreeing that Luke and Mark are not eyewitnesses. They've heard these stories. What happens to the stories? So the question is, that, that's what happens in every oral culture that, that's been, ever been studied. So is it true with the early Christians? And there's only one way to find out, which is to compare their stories with each other. When two authors tell us the same story, do they tell the same story or not? Or are there contradictions? Are there discrepancies? Now, Peter deals with this in, in his book. He has, a, he has a chapter on contradictions. Mm. Uh, but it, uh, I, didn't, I, mean, I, I didn't quite understand it because he, he listed, I forget what it was, six or seven possible contradictions and then showed they weren't contradictions. But there, there weren't six or seven things that anybody points out to as contradictions. And so the ones that people do point out as contradictions, he didn't didn't okay. deal with. And so I'd like to. Well, well, let, I mean, you, you, I know you're well known, you know, in, in debates and talks for rattling off, you know, for instance, differences and discrepancies between the resurrection accounts and yeah. those sorts of things. And you'll say, did, was it two women or was it one woman or was it, you know, was there an angel or wasn't there an angel and so on? And so for you, does just simply the fact that the different accounts have different details in them about the same general story, if you like, is is that if you like enough to say? didn't happen no. is that is that no what, what's going on then no. what's what's the no the question is if somebody tells a story is the story right or not mm-hmm. and if two people tell stories that are at odds with each other not just different mm-hmm. i mean of course everybody tells a story differently but it doesn't mean they're both wrong you know four people can tell the same story tell it com- very differently and they're just one person's telling one part of it another mm-hmm. telling another mm-hmm. one's emphasizing mm-hmm. one thing one and so of course that kind of thing happens all the time and that doesn't mean, but if you've got stories that have differences that cannot be reconciled with one, one says one thing, one says the other, mm. not whether there's two women or one woman. Mm. If, you, if two women go to the tomb in one story and one woman goes to the tomb in another, you just say, well, okay, this person's mentioning the one, but there mm. were two. You mm. know, so mm. there are ways mm. to reconcile. Sure. There are other things that simply can't be reconciled. Okay. Give us a couple of examples and we'll see what Peter What I would say. suggest that people listening to this do is mm. not take my word for it or Peter's word mm-hmm. for it because what people are going to do is people on my side are going to agree with me. People on <laughs> Peter's side are going to agree with him. And so I suggest just don't do that. Okay. Just, just do it for yourself. Get two stories in the Gospels and go through them word for word, line for line, write down everything that happens and compare your lists. And it doesn't matter, do it with the birth stories, do it with the crucifixion stories, do it with the resurrection, just do it yourself Mm -hmm. and find out, are there differences here or not? I mean, just, okay, just one example. One Mm -hmm. example, it involves Luke. Mm -hmm. Um, The death of Judas Iscariot. Mm -hmm. So Judas uh, in, in, uh, in Mark, Luke and John, Judas, nothing happens to him after, he just disappears. Okay. In Matthew's gospel, Judas hangs himself. Mm-hmm. And what happens is he goes, uh, he feels remorse about what he's done. He's betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He, he tries to return the 30 pieces. The high priest won't take it. So he throws them down in the temple and goes off and hangs himself. And um, the priests then say, oh, we've got these 30 pieces of silver. We can't put them back in the treasury because it's blood money. It's mm-hmm. used to betray blood. And so, so they go off and they buy a field, and it's called the field of blood because mm-hmm. it's purchased the blood money after Judas has hanged himself. 
Luke also wrote the book of Acts, as we were saying. Mm -hmm. And in chapter one, there's a second account of Jesus' death. In this account, what happens is uh, there's nothing about Judas hanging himself, nothing about the priest buying the field. In this account, Judas goes and buys the field before he dies, and he doesn't hang himself. He somehow falls head first, and his his intestines broke, break open and bleed all over the ground. Mm -hmm. And so the people in Jerusalem start calling this the field of blood because Judas okay. bled all over it. So, so for, those two so, accounts so, cannot be reconciled. Okay. okay. So, and um, before we hear Peter's response to that, is the issue then that you know we 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 don't know what happened to Judas at all because these accounts, as far as you, you can see. I think we can know some things. Okay. I think there really was a Judas. Mm -hmm. um, I think that he uh, really did betray Jesus uh, uh, to the authorities, and uh, I think he probably came to some kind of untimely death that was somehow connected with the field, with the field of Jerusalem. Of blood. But, but, yeah. we, but as to reconciling these two stories, they're just different. As but far if as you want to read so Matthew and say, yes, that's what really happened, okay. or if you want to read Acts, that's what really it, happened. It's helpful to drill down on a specific mm -hmm. example sometimes. Sure. So, so how do you read these two accounts of Judas's sure. death? Sure. I'd like to come to that first, but I hope also to come back on the whole question of oral tradition. Okay, <laughs> we will. Stage. We will. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really interesting that we got these two accounts and uh, Bart uh, mentioned two things as he went through the account in Acts. One is he used the word somehow, that uh, Judas somehow and the phrases became headlong. Well, that to me is just crying out for some more details. We need to explain. We need some sort of like vertical elevation. Oh, Matthew has vertical elevation because he has to hang himself. So I'd want to say that the account in Acts is is crying out for a bit more. Uh, and the other issue we got is his intestines. How on earth do his intestines start bursting forth? I mean, like, that wouldn't normally happen if you just Simply fall. fell over in So a field, in other yeah. words, I'd want to say, you know, uh, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, as for... So how did it happen? So how, how did it happen? <laughs> I'd want to say, I don't... I think you, you can put put the two together. Probably the data are underdetermined, as in that is, I can't... Um, there would be multiple scenarios that give would me, fit give those. Give me one. Um, let's say someone, someone someone hangs and then the rope snaps and you know after 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 they're dead and their entrails burst out. Okay. I'm not a medic on that, but you know. Yes. Okay. So let me ask this: If somebody's hanging and the rope snaps, mm -hmm. that's happened before. Mm -hmm. How do they fall? Down. Do they fall head first? Well, it depends what their does feet. Does it heads. depend? <laughs> yes, it does. It depends what they're hanging head. over. What do you mean? Well, I mean, if you're hanging over something and there's a rock forward and you're going to trip on it and you go head for forward, I mean, like these things can happen. I don't know. It sounds like we're doing CSI here, you know, I mean, like, crime I, scene I, investigation. I, I, okay. I, just think, I just think the data is underdetermined. Let me just okay. say this. Yeah, yeah it's underdetermined. So um, to reconcile it, you have to come up with a completely implausible scenario to reconcile it. You can reconcile anything. Let, let me just right, let me yeah, give okay. you an example okay. how you can reconcile uh, anything. Right. right now in America, they're celebrating uh, the uh, moon landing. One out of six Americans don't think there was a moon landing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have people say there was not a moon landing and people say there was a moon landing. And so, well, how do you, those two, and most human beings would say, well, you know, it either is this or it's not that. Mm -hmm. If you really want to, you could say, oh no, you can reconcile that because actually uh, they, they first didn't get there <laughs> and so they didn't land, but then they circled around the earth again and went back and they landed the second time. So there wasn't and there was. Now you could do that. But like, is it really the best okay. explanation? But but uh, I mean, firstly, I'd want to ask a how important is it that we know the exact way in which Judas met his fate? And and secondly, are, are you essentially trying to come up with some theory that, that matches I'm, two impossible? I, I'm not tr uh, trying to say we know exactly um, how things happened. I think there are multiple ways. I'm trying to use charity. Yeah. And the same charity I'd want to use on Bart. You see, Bart a few minutes ago said that some things cannot be reconciled. Then a few minutes later said you can reconcile anything. And, <laughs> and I'd want to say I have the charity to say that there's a coherence behind Bart's thinking, he'd want to qualify one in the light of the other, and that the way we should uh, deal with these things is we should, uh, you know, do the same with ancient sources as I would do Okay, you know, so it's fairly easy Bart. to reconcile is, is what, I, what I said. I would, I, would, I would like to know a single case in history where somebody was hanged and he died by going head first and his guts opened up. I don't have one uh, You don't, of course hand, you don't. But, nobody, but, nobody does. So is that, so either 
either they are irreconcilable or they're not. I mean, you obviously feel that there's, we, we, you say it's underdetermined. So we've got two accounts, both in which involve a field, both of which involve Judas um, killing himself, uh, you know, Dying. because he, he, yeah. he feels, you know, but essentially, I suppose a lot of people might sort of sit back and say, well, look, guys, we know he died. We know that he betrayed Jesus. Does it matter I'm exactly? Not, I'm not arguing. I'm not of? arguing that the Gospels are completely unreliable. I'm not no. saying. I'm not saying that the Gospels have historical information mm -hmm. in them. Can you trust that what they say about what happened in the life of Jesus actually happened or not? I'm saying in many cases, no, you cannot trust that. If Peter wants to say that in every case they're trustworthy, that would be worth talking about. Like, do you, do you think that there are any mistakes? I don't, but you uh, don't but think. I, but, can you explain how your view would be different from a fundamentalist view? Well, I think that's not a very helpful analytical term. No, I just um, want to know where you stand. I mean, do you what, think what, it's what, completely what, what, inerrant? Um, what, I think that the traditional Christian view is that all Scripture is true. That does not mean that the copy that someone has in front of them, a no, copy no, of no, the I'm not talking about copies. Not talking about copies. You know, valid. But do I uh, um, follow the a belief that when God speaks words of Scripture, they are they um, bear His own um, character of truthfulness. Yes. So you think everything in the Bible is true? There are no mistakes of any kind. The word Bible has multiple values: a physical value, and if I prefer the word Scripture, do I believe all Scripture is true? Yes. With no mistakes of any kind anywhere. Do I? Yeah, I believe that God didn't make any mistakes of any kind. I don't think God makes mistakes either. But I'm not talking about God. But I'm you don't believe in God. Uh, exactly. But, but I mean, I, 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 do, I do need to be able to, you know, express what I do believe and not have words put in my mouth. Well, well you no, know. What? No, so so no, I, what? I believe that all scripture is uh, true. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and okay. from that point no, of view, not... you're willing to look for ways in which there, there can be a reconciling of what Bart obviously believes are irreconcilable stories. Uh, yes, not that I'm necessarily that interested in following them up because, again, there are multiple alternatives. I mean, you can look at this... The word he hanged himself, you know, um, in in Matthew is just one word in Greek. So you ask yourself, how much detail is that actually telling you about what actually went on? With a, yeah, a okay, but, you but know, you, you know. should explain to people how lexicography works. I mean, how do we know what it means? Well, we'd need to look in, at surrounding context and so on, but often things are underdetermined. I mean, so... Is that, is that word underdetermined? Uh I'd need to have have a, a, a greater a greater look at it, but you know, you, you can visualize something from I that. Just and we need to what ask yourselves the question: you know, um, I just is this what, really a defeater? And I don't think it is. I just wonder what it would take. I mean, if if you're already committed to the idea that there can't be any mistakes, then how would you be open to the idea that there might be a mistake? So I think the way I'd look at it is like this: um, it's to do with having a coherent view of. Um, a, a worldview. So I think you'd be pretty sceptical if I proposed a miracle to you because it would be inconsistent with your worldview. Uh, in the same way, I would say I've got lots of positive reasons for thinking that scripture is miraculous and it all builds up to this climax with Jesus and there's prophecy beforehand and he seems to do lots of remarkable things. And so I'm trying trying to make sense of, you know, yeah. of, of things together no, as I, I think you would do. I have no I have no problem with that. But what I'd like is to to be knowledge that that's doing theology it's not doing history history, oh, yeah. and history I, I never, is not I'm, done I, history is not done by coming at it with a theological presupposition about what had to happen you look at the evidence and then you see does the evidence move me that way or not you don't approach it by saying this has to be right because but God are you said saying it. that that no one who holds to a theological view let's say of the authority of scripture can therefore do proper history right. I'm saying that if you're going to do proper history, you cannot allow your presuppositions about God to, to affect outcomes. the sure. outcome. Right. And I, I would say I've never tried to claim that I am doing history. I okay. often uh, would want to make a distinction between the sorts of things that go on in history departments and what I believe rationally you should trust. I mean, mm. all sorts of male on female violence have happened for which there is only one witness mm. and you probably can't prove it to a history department uh, but y you you should jolly well believe the victim when mm. she says this has happened you know there's all sorts of things in life that we believe on the basis of one testimony but which won't rise to the criteria the fairly artificial criteria of a history department which is also going to take on the overall worldview that mm. tends to be around in academia at the time but what peter's saying though is that christian history isn't the same as history in other words if you go to a history department 
there are there are a criteria just as if there's a crime that's committed mm -hmm. if there's a crime committed the way you solve the crime is not by asking the victim what happened. You have a trial and you look at evidence and you want to go where the evidence mm -hmm. goes. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go with what you, your gut tells you, this has to be right because I'm just going to trust this is person. Is there a sense though in which for you, Peter, the, if you like, the secular standards, if you like, of history are enough to affirm and confirm, if you like, the, the theological stance that you take uh, regarding the Bible? I think history. you've got several different things going on here. One is, um, a history department will never lose out. Uh, th well, it, it tends to be weighted towards not believing something. So when, um, you know, G.R. Driver first heard Sir Godfrey Driver, a great Hebrew professor, that the Dead Sea Scrolls had been discovered, he said, you know, probably not genuine, and it turned out to be genuine, but his reputation didn't suffer damage. Mm -hmm. When, um, you know, Hugh Trevor Roper said the Hitler diaries are probably genuine and they turned out not to be, his reputation really took a hit. Mm. So there is a way in which I think it's a bit like hedge fund managing, <laughs> you know, that history departments can stack things so that, um, you know, skepticism is more favoured. That, again, is different from what you do as a jury uh, when you're looking at someone. That's also different from what you do as a friend if someone comes to you and says to you that they're a victim and you say, I trust you. Right. So I think these are all different things. My argument is not about whether I can prove something to a history department. My argument is about whether I can show that this is rationally able to be trusted. But but my the problem is when you get down to the details, mm -hmm. Because when you, when you start looking at detailed contradictions, of which there are hundreds, um, the only way to reconcile them is to come up with implausible scenarios that never happen. And so do you really want to go that route and say that, um, that in fact, you know, it's just like this is so implausible, but it's got to be right because the scripture cannot be wrong. So I don't feel a burden to come up with particular um, reconciliations and harmonies and answers, you know, the sort of Christian answer man style thing, because I, I don't think that's really necessary because I think that life is full of things that um, uh, have w on their own 1% probability or 2%, whatever it is. The, the, and, and often what I'm looking at is the overall pattern. And I recognize that uh, I have um, some uh, difficulties in my view in terms of how I, I take scripture, but I think others who are more skeptical have far more difficulties on their view because uh, you know they have to come to implausible views about and we, maybe we talk about this sometime yeah. about the resurrection or something like that and I, i'd find them less plausible you know we're going to go to a quick break and um <laughs> fascinating i'm sorry to interrupt it is a great dialogue at this point um but we will talk about oral tradition as well because i think this is significant and the words of jesus uh, because if you like if, if there's anything that christians you know, uh, need to rely on it's it's whether Jesus really said the things that he's ascribed to have been said in the gospel. So we'll continue this conversation in a very short moment's time. If you listen to Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio and enjoy the conversations between Christians and skeptics, then this is the perfect app for you. For the latest updates, podcasts, videos, articles, bonus content, and much more, download the Premier Unbelievable app today. So continuing our conversation on can we trust the story of Jesus? We're looking at the historical reliability of the Gospels. Bar M and, and Peter Williams with me. It's been a fantastic discussion so far and we're into part three now. And um, why don't we talk about the words of Jesus, folks? Because, mm -hmm. you know, that's what it often comes down to in the end. Um, just in that last segment, Bart, you were saying that, hey, Peter, are you doing theology or are you doing history? And many people, you know, who are critical, let's say, of the historical reliability of the Gospels would say, well, this is more someone doing theology, someone kind of wanting to give Jesus a certain supernatural uh, son of God look. And we can't trust that this was actually the words of Jesus that are coming, that are being put in his mouth and so on. Is, is that is, is that your view that the, the Gospels in that sense are more a work of theology than than history? Uh, so I don't think I'd put it that way because okay. I think um, I, I know that there are there are critics who say that you know it's all just made up and it's just, just you know putting people's own theological beliefs onto Jesus and I I don't think that I mean I think that there uh, there's a lot of material in the Gospels that absolutely goes back to the historical Jesus I think some of the sayings in the Gospels actually go back to the historical Jesus so I uh, so I I don't think that they are just theology uh, I also don't think that they are just history 
uh, I think it's quite clear that the authors of the New Testament have shifted their stories in line with their theological views and that the storytellers before them did the same thing. The, these stories have been passed along for 30, 40, 50 years. And one person tells it to the next, tells the next. Everybody's telling it in their own way, just as we all tell stories in our own way. And when you tell it in your own way, you put your own framing on it. And these are people who are believers in Jesus. So, of course, they've got certain ideas about Jesus, and so they're framing it. And so the task of the historian is to decide which of these sayings of Jesus and which of these activities of Jesus, which of these experiences of Jesus probably actually happened, and which ones have been either modified or made up in the process of the retelling. And so I think that it isn't a simple matter of are they theology or are they history. I think they're both. And anybody who thinks that they're pure history, I think, would, would have to bear the burden of proof. I mean, you wrote a book called um, How Jesus Became God. Uh, and of course, one of the key claims of the Gospels is Jesus claiming divinity, claiming uh, to be God. And that takes different manifestations in different Gospels. But what's your view? Is that is your view that anything that looks like Jesus claiming some kind of divine status is more likely a, an amendment of the Jesus story than an original part? So I wouldn't I wouldn't put it quite that simply. I mean, there there are people today who claim to be God, and so I don't say they didn't say that mm -hmm. because you know somebody wouldn't say that. People do say that, mm -hmm. uh, and so the the issue is always uh, how do you know what Jesus said? Um, when it comes to the New Testament Gospels, uh, we of course have the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as I was saying earlier, it looks like Matthew and Luke have both used Mark. Mark is probably our earliest account. Matthew and Luke are later. Matthew and Luke appear to have used some other source that, that we don't have anymore for a number of their sayings of Jesus. And scholars have called the source Q, and it doesn't matter to my argument whether you think Q existed or not. But, but Luke does say he had earlier sources, so it's not implausible they mm -hmm. had a source that had some of Jesus' sayings. Um, and so what scholars do when trying to figure out what Jesus really said, once they acknowledge that maybe he didn't say everything, because we know Jesus didn't say everything that's attributed to him in the early church, because we have other gospels that everybody agrees Jesus didn't say these things. Okay. So somebody's making up stories. And the question is, and people, and people are changing stories. And so and we, we have absolute evidence that there's no question about it. So the question is whether the four, that happens in the four gospels or not, or whether somehow they were protected mm -hmm. from ever recording anything that Jesus actually didn't ever say. You know, were they protected from that? And what is striking to most scholars is that when you lay out the sources chronologically, over time Jesus starts changing the sorts of things that he says. And so, for example, in Mark and in Q, which would be the, the sayings in Matthew and Luke not found in Mark, those would probably be our earliest sources. Uh, Jesus principally talks about the kingdom of God that's coming. There's a kingdom of God that's coming. You need to repent and prepare for it because if you don't, you're going to be destroyed. If you are on the side of God, you'll enter into this kingdom and there'll be a, a glorious existence. And so Jesus is preaching about the coming kingdom of God uh, in, in Mark and Q. When you get to the Gospel of John, Jesus no longer preaches about the kingdom of God. He doesn't tell people to repent in preparation for the coming of the kingdom of God. He doesn't say that you, you will be destroyed when the kingdom of God comes. He, uh, th the way he talks is, is different now. And rather than talking principally about God and the coming kingdom, he talks about himself, who he is. And so you get the, some of the most famous sayings of Jesus. I am the, the way, I the am. truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes mm. to the Father but by me. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. The before, good shepherd. I, yeah. Before Abraham was, I am. I mm. and the Father are one. You get mm. all of these claims, many of which have uh, a component of uh, divine identity connected with him. He's claiming to be a divine being. That's crystal clear in the narrative of John because whenever Je Jesus will say, I and the Father are one, and the Jews will pick up stones to stone him to death for committing blasphemy. You don't have those stories in the earliest Gospels. And it's, it's striking, and you have to explain, if Jesus did go around calling himself a divine being, um, you know, if that really happened, mm -hmm. as John says, mm -hmm. John says it mm -hmm. happened, uh, and it's, it's the major teaching of Jesus and John. If that's what happened, why isn't it in Mark or Q? Is it, is it that they didn't think it was important to report mm -hmm. that part of Jesus' teachings? Or a more plausible explanation for most people, for most critical scholars, a more plausible explanation is that over time, uh, 
the Christians' understanding of Jesus changed, and they started seeing him as less of just a human messiah and more as some kind of divine being right. over time. And, and as they saw him that way, they recorded his words in those ways. And so the later sayings of John are later representations of what later Christians said about Jesus rather than what the earliest Christians. And if you think the earliest Christians said it, thought this about Jesus, why don't they record those sayings? So this developmental idea in the Gospels and, and <clears> that earlier Christian, later traditions around Jesus are developing the idea and the words. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great example of showing how so much scholarship, while claiming to be historically neutral, is basically very philosophically dri driven. Because I think even as you tease out your chronology and your development, I mean, it's really interesting how it's all stacking up towards a system in which you don't get Jesus, you know, um, uh, claiming uh, as much early on and i th i think that it's it's been developing for a, a couple hundred years in it within scholarship and it's so intertwined um the historical argumentation and the sort of slight philosophical nudges here and there that it's really really hard to mm. to unpack pick but i would just say let, let's let's take, take mark's gospel an example mark begins with this opening you know i'm going to send my messenger before your face and it's all about uh, you know, quoting the Old Testament, uh, but with um, uh, John the Baptist going before the face of Jesus when, you know, it's about uh, in Malachi uh, that it's uh, from, you know, uh, the messenger going before the face of God. And so it's presenting Jesus as in that place of God. Next chapter, he's forgiving sins. A couple of chapters later, he's stilling the storm like only God does. Like, and it's it's p calling on themes from Jonah. A couple of chapters later, uh, chapter six, he's walking on the water like only God does in mm -hmm. Job chapter nine, and then he gets to the the boat and he he says, uh, "Be of courage, I am." It's pretty dramatic. I am there in Mark six verse fifty. So it uh, it's not just that you know John's I am saying is slightly different, but there there is precedent mm -hmm. uh, f for them. And I'd want to say. A lot of people see this as a systematic presentation of um, uh, Jesus's uh, very, very exalted status, such, such that people are wondering, you know, who is this? They're asking this question. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that it's doing it through, um, you know, a, a sort of more Socratic method mm -hmm. of, of getting you to think who, who this is, is, uh, you know, is not i mean god's the only one who opens the eyes of the blind and that's also something jesus does you know uniquely in the gospel so i'd want to say that all of these things come together to give you a portrait a very uh, exalted portrait of jesus so there's a there's a consistency as far as you're concerned between those earlier if you like accounts in mark i th I, th I, th so I think the, the, the whole question of development you know we've got to say when we lay out sources and we say this comes before this and this what actually are we basing that on how much is um, historically verifiable uh, how much of it is philosophical system how much of it is literary uh, system and, and what's fed into that and I think all of those things have to be laid on the table so that you can be very clear about when you're saying this is this is a fact you know what's it actually based on yeah so I'd love to respond to that I mean I, um, I mean when, w Pete when you start out by saying that this chronology uh, the <coughs> development is based on a chronology that's driven by skepticism I, I didn't say driven by skepticism, but yeah, you, okay. What did you say? I think it's it's got an input of, of that. Because I was just going on your chronology. I mean, you 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 said earlier that you think Mark was the first gospel. And I that, haven't said that. Oh, okay. You said that you thought John was the end of the first, it was I'm, the last I'm, gospel. Yes, that's, I have said that. Which it, one do you think is first? I don't have a view. Okay. Would you agree John's later <clears> than the others? Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's all. That's the only development I need. And I don't see why skepticism has anything to do with that. I mean, I believe this when I was an evangelical Christian. So, uh, yeah. so, um, but then you want to say that uh, it's wrong to say that Jesus isn't portrayed as divine in Mark because mm. of all these other things. Mm. Um, and I know you can go through them one by one. No, 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 no. It's, well, I mean, there are things you say that aren't true. I mean, it's not true that only God can heal the blind. Prophets do it all the time. Faith healers do it. So no, they in, do it with in, the power in the, of God. In the, in the Old Testament. Yes. So, well, and in the New Testament, I mean... Uh, where, where in the Old Testament people heal on the blind? Well, in Jewish tradition, it's all over the place. Yeah, but not in the Old Testament. Yes. But why would you say that well, only God to, can heal the blind? I mean, I know be, people who say they were blind. That, uh, that no, I'm, I'm trying healed. to think, in the Old Testament, where are there people who heal on the blind? Uh, I, don't, I don't know of any. There aren't any. 
So, but that was, I didn't say anything about the because, Old Testament. So, so I, I was saying, sorry. Go, you bet, go, go I, ahead. What's I, the I'm point? In, in the Old true. Testament portrayal, only God heals the blind, and then Jesus comes along and does it. That's yeah, but so do other Jewish healers. I think it's significant the way Jesus is portrayed. In, if you think about the It class. doesn't make somebody divine to be able to heal somebody. You have healers throughout history. They aren't God. They're empowered by God. But I think that... Um, the signs dis, um, in, in the message to John the Baptist is one of the things. Okay, okay. Know, so let me, that, that's just a side point. Right, I just don't yeah, think okay, it's true. Yeah. But, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, you're saying that Mark portrays Jesus as divine, mm -hmm. and that, isn't, that has no bearing on what I was saying. I didn't deny that. I think that Mark does see Jesus as divine. What I'm asking is, what did Jesus himself say about himself? Now, Mm -hmm. uh, you pointed out things like uh, John the Baptist looking to Jesus, Jesus walking in the water, Jesus healing the blind. I mean, we could talk about each of all those, but I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing okay. that Mark portrays Jesus as divine. My question is, did Jesus go around Palestine, Galilee, and then Judea saying, I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. These are mm -hmm. sayings found in the Gospel of John, which you agree is the mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. of the Gospels. Those sayings are not found in Mark, which you agree is an earlier Gospel. And they're not only found not in Mark. They're not found in Luke. They're not found in Matthew. They're not from Q. They're not in any of the early sources where Jesus says these things. When you pointed out that in Mark's Gospel, people continually are asking, who is this? Mm -hmm. The answer is never, he is God. And Jesus himself never says, I am God, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, I totally, or their sources. I, mm -hmm. I to totally agree on that. I mean, there could be all sorts of reasons not to say that. Um, but what I want to say is there is precedent for all of the I am saying. So, for instance, um, J Jesus, um, you know, I am the bread of life. He says in the synoptics, this is my body, you know, take, take this bread. Um, he, um, you know, says, I am the good shepherd in John. And then he's portraying himself in stories as, as basically fulfilling the role of the shepherd. Um, he says, you know, I am the light of the world in John. In Matthew, he says, you are the light of the world to his disciples. If he's prepared to accept they're the light of the world, I don't see why he can't say that he is as well. So I think all of these things, we can, we can, we can make connections. Um, and I don't think, yes, the Gospels are about nine hours long when you read them in English. So in this two-hour section of John, there are things which aren't in the others. But don't build a massive, you know, um, castle out of that. I mean, it seems, seems to me, of course, there are going to be some things that yes. are in one that aren't in the no, others. No, I, I, I agree with that. And I'm not trying to build a castle out of it because I, I'm just responding to Justin's question. This wouldn't be a point that I would have raised. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't, this wouldn't be, this Justin's is not why fault. I think the Gospels are unreliable. So this isn't, <laughs> this, for me, this isn't even the point. But I will say that um, uh, the whole idea of development is that there are things earlier that get developed later. Mm -hmm. And so the, the fact that you see things earlier that could lead to John's proclamations, uh, is that's what the developmental view is. What you don't get is um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus saying that he's God. And my point is, if the historical Jesus really did go around saying those things, it is inconceivable to me that our earliest sources fail to mention it. Mm -hmm. Like they didn't think that part was important. This, is, this would be the most significant thing to say. And yet none of them, not just Mark, but Matthew and their sources, by the way. I mean, scholar, I don't know what you think, but uh, virtually every scholar I know thinks that you've got Mark and you've got Q and you've got M and you've got L and then you've got Matthew and you've got Luke themselves. You've got six sources before John. None of them has these things. And so are we supposed to think, well, yeah, yeah, that was just like a minor detail they decided not to get into. I, I just no, find no, it no, completely but, implausible. But I think, you know, John doesn't have Jesus go around saying, I am God either. So I think... Uh, I but, and the Father are one. Before yeah. Abraham was, I am. Yeah, the, I, the, these are these are big things. But, you know, I mean, when you walk up to, I mean, okay, you may not believe it happened, but when it's portrayed as someone walking up to people on the water and then saying, I am, you know, it's a pretty dramatic thing, isn't it? Uh, so, you know, in the Gospel of John, the man born blind is asked, were you the one who was born blind? 
and he replies, ego a me. Uh, sure, sure. I am. Sure. Saying I am is just a way of saying yes. Yeah, but it's not just that when you're just walked across the water. It's well, something Peter different. Peter walked something on the water too. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, <laughs> okay, does that make I, him God? No, again, but <laughs> okay. there is a difference. But he was the one who fell down, of course. <laughs> I, I, I mean, exactly. He wasn't as mu- Exactly. <laughs> within the story. But Peter doesn't go around saying but, I, I mean, am. <laughs> don't, I mean, what do you think Mark 6 is about when Jesus walks on the water? I mean, isn't this portraying He's something? He's showing the God. He, he, I think Mark understands Jesus as a divine being. If if we drill down a little bit on the the synoptics, because yeah, obviously sure. John, in a way, kind of there there are lots of detailed arguments about exactly what 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 John represents in terms of the Jesus story. But I suppose your argument is that there is an oral tradition before you get to the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, especially, uh, and that already in the, that process we're getting a different. Uh, story of Jesus, different sayings of Jesus, and, and things changing uh, before they get written down in that way. Yeah, but and it's not just, it's just not a hypothetical based on oral, on the, what we know about oral tradition. It's based on the fact that you can compare what the Gospels say to each, o- to each other and see that there are differences. Why, why for you, Peter, are you satisfied that we've got a, if you like, a historically reliable set of sayings and stories and words of Jesus that haven't really changed a great deal from from what he would have actually said to people. So I, I think it's really the simplest hypothesis. So if if we look at things that are only in Matthew or only in Luke, is sort of uh, for, for for the sake. And what what you find is these things fit very well with their early context. I mean, whoever comes up with the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, the rich man and Lazarus, uh, you know, the, the, the prodigal son. I mean, there's some genius g- at an early stage. Um, and it makes far more sense to me to say this is Jesus. These stories also have huge integrity. They have very deep um, Old Testament references. Um, they, they fit Palestinian Judaism. So the simplest hypothesis is to say they come with integrity. Uh, now, one of the things, that I, you know, as you hear about oral tradition is I, I think sometimes what um, Bart is talking about is more like ac- actuaries. You know, actuaries mm. study how long people tend to live. And gravestones tell you how long a particular person actually lived. And I think you can have this actuarial approach uh, to the Gospels where you say, well, how likely is it stuff got through? And I'd want to say, well, look at the actual text of the Gospels to see whether stuff got through, not um, start with this sort of a priori system of how much can get through based on oral tradition. And and I think uh, I'd also want to say, uh, and I'd love, love Bart to answer, you know, does he really believe that when people are doing um, history of Jesus in, uh, you know, u- universities, that there is no input from naturalistic worldviews as they work in mainstream universities? I, I think there is, uh, you know, as I know, obviously, there are Christians working in universities, but I think it does affect. So, so, for instance, that would mean, well, any story or saying that involves mir- the miraculous is automatically going to be assumed to have been yeah, and not automatically. It, it's it's simply it's 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 a, it's a question of subtle bias that that, that will actually show up cumulatively, mm. you know, within uh, an academic sociology. Yeah. So a couple of issues there. Then, firstly, um, the oral tradition itself is it really as 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 flawed potentially in Jesus's case as, as you yeah. think it, yeah, it yeah, would yeah. be? In, yeah. Yeah. In no, that's great. Tradition. No, that's great. Yeah. So what I would say is that. Um, uh, I uh, I do not approach the Gospels with an a priori view of how oral tradition works. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't start stu- studying oral tradition until about five or six years ago, mm-hmm. uh, and I knew years before that that there were problems in the Gospels because when you compare two accounts with each other, there are odds in ways that can't be reconciled. And so the only reason to look at oral tradition for me was to see, well, why is that? Um, and so I didn't, didn't approach it with any kind of a priori uh, sense sense of it, um, I, uh, I just started reading the scholarship. Mm-hmm. And if, uh, if anyone thinks that the stories about Jesus were preserved intact, without change, mm-hmm. over um, uh, 40, 50 years, I, then I would say two things. One is, uh, how do you demonstrate that from the fact that you've got Gospels that have differences in them that are irreconcilable? Secondly, what do you say about all this scholarship? I mean, I listed a bunch of names earlier mm-hmm. uh, of scholars who who aren't, they're not interested in showing whether Jesus existed or whether he, sure, 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 sure. they're just trying to figure out how oral tradition works. And every one of them comes to the same conclusion. So if you, if you don't agree with that scholarship, I would like to know 
what are the what are the flaws in that scholarship? Because it's it's not just one methodology. It's it's literary scholars and anthropologists, and I mean, and they all come to the same conclusion. So yeah, okay. But I don't know about the other bit because the other bit was even more important. Than what well, we well, the, 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 go the, on the, the question no, no. of the naturalistic well, well, side. Well, 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 well okay, let's well, come to that. Maybe, but maybe respond. To I'm, I'm not saying that the. Um, studies of oral tradition are not correct i'm just saying they may not be very germane um, we have the four gospels and you start with the text and say you know we don't know that this comes through a long line of oral tradition we simply don't know that you have the text of the gospels the gospels don't come with dates on the question is when we look at the, at the text itself are there signs of reliability? And what I'd want to say is because of the consistent pattern of getting Palestinian culture, geography, religion, and so on right, it doesn't make a lot of sense to say that what we have in these Gospels is coming through a very long... Um, right, well, I would just uh, say that's... And, and, and you would say... So are you saying then that... that you don't think there's a sort of, as you say, telephone game here where it's changing uh, That's what I'm saying. So it, it's not, it's not, it's not it, a question of, of particularly about time. Um, I'm agnostic on the question of time. It's about the quality of the actual text when you look at it. Are you saying that Luke is not correct that he got these things from oral sources? But when when you, it depends what you mean by oral source. Of course, yes, he spoke to people. That, that, but, that's yeah, what an oral yeah, source yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then you can't... Um, apply a whole load of scholarship about oral traditions to a question of when um, Luke has gone round and potentially interviewed several people about the same event you know Does what Luke quality of information no but he doesn't say he doesn't and no, no, again I'm, doesn't. I'm saying start with the material yes. within the text I completely and, and, agree you start with the text uh, 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 that's why I start with the text you look at these two texts and you compare them to one mm -hmm. another and you don't seem to be wanting to do that because you want to. Just well, go, go on, give, give me an example. I mean, wh wh well, the death of Judas, we already did. Yeah, but but I'm I'm saying I don't see any reason why these can't have come from okay. people having detailed uh, conversations. But in terms with of oral tradition, let me just say, if these gospels are written forty or fifty years later, and that's an and F. Luke tells you that not only that he that he's basing this on things that he's heard and read and that uh, this is how it happens in the book of Acts that it's not a stretch to think that people are telling stories for 40 or 50 years this is not this is what we know but it's not what you know because the date the gospels don't come with dates saying written 40 or 50 years All after right. when do you think Luke was written I don't have a I don't I mean have, is during it, Luke's lifetime is it your view that Luke did interview people who were eyewitnesses of yes, the events yes. so in that sense you don't see that there's this 40 or 50 year gap you see him talking to people who obviously are some sometimes yeah, I mean, the events but it, but it has to first, be during the lifetime of someone who can be in a companion when of was paul he a companion in the 50s, of paul? And, 50s and 60s okay so when would it be written sometime in the lifetime of someone who can be in the, a companion the of paul 60s, in the 50s and 60s. 60s at the earliest let's say okay 60s Okay, so at the earliest. 30, 35 years later. Okay. But then when's he doing the interviews? He's talking to people. Well, and, what, you know, where, where are you getting this idea that he interviewed people? No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying he says that he has, has talked to no. those who no, are... No, he doesn't say that. What does he say? Re, would you, re, would he you say, give us he the does introduction not, he does to, not say to, he Luke, interviewed anybody. to Luke and Axe? He, he, uh, so As we receive them from those who... He, he says the word. that uh, many before him wrote an account of these things and, now, and that have come down to us by eyewitnesses and, and uh, ministers of the word. But when he says that he's followed every, down, the, yeah. in other words, these other people are basing on I'm, and then, and so he doesn't say he may have interviewed people, but you know, interviewing people. But okay, I'm not going to go there. But <laughs> he may have interviewed people. He doesn't say he did. But even if he did interview people, uh, how does that make him accurate? Because the only well, way they know if he's accurate. Closely. He said, oh, so, that's so, the phrase, right, right, right. Yeah, well, so if he says he followed him closely, they must be getting it right. Why don't <laughs> well, you see whether he contradicts another source or not? Why well, don't you do that? Sure, I'm very happy, happy to do that. But I mean, as... as you yeah, know, but then you just reconcile them by saying... That you <laughs> I haven't... I, I'm just saying it, the burden of proof is on you to show that they, they you know... That's, they that's exactly why I use the Judas example. And as you know, I could come up with a hundred other examples. You can come up with other examples, but... But you, you know, never deal with these in your book. Well, it's a short book. <laughs> um, you have a but, whole chapter but, on contradictions, but you don't deal with any of the contradictions. Pages. Um, but you don't deal with a single contradiction. What I do show is that Jesus deliberately used formal contradictions as part of his teaching yes, device. but nobody denies and, that. And, and I think sometimes, so, somehow people think that because they find this text and this text that they are you know, um, in tension with each other, somehow they have falsified the, I don't the think view that. I don't think that, that, at all. that the texts are trustworthy. But that's not, the, that's not my view at all. Nobody argues that Jesus couldn't argue paradox, so I don't know who you're arguing against. But I, I mean, what, what's interesting to me is, is going back to the Judas example, you know, you're not saying Judas didn't 
kill himself potentially you're not saying he didn't betray Look, Jesus. I'm arguing it's against just, the fundamentalist view of the right, Bible that exactly. there are no mistakes of any kind I'm not arguing against Christianity I'm not arguing against believers I'm not arguing against people who want to think the Bible has a lot of historical information in it I'm saying that well, if you have a fundamentalist view of the Bible there can be no mistake I just think you're do, wrong do you have that. a fundamentalist view of the Bible Peter that, uh, that seems to be the accusation self-designation self I want to use because I would want to say I'm I'm doing the sort of thing that Augustine would, would mm -hmm. talk about and others, uh, you know, with a long tradition and cultural knowledge, Jerome would do the same. And so I see myself as in a tradition of, you know, um, Catholic with a small c scholarship, you know, of, um, of down, so down I wouldn't, the ages. I wouldn't call Peter a fundamentalist. Okay. I, Thank it you. Was a gen no, but, I, <laughs> but, but the reality is a fundamentalist is always the guy who's to the right of you. Okay. Fundam even people who are hardcore fundamentalists very rarely admit that they're fundamentalists because it's become a bad well, word. Of course, it's it a loaded, be, it loaded used to be a positive yeah. word. Yeah. When when I was in college in the 1970s, we saw it as a positive word. We were fundamentalists because it meant we subscribed to the fundamentals. One of which was the Bible has no mistakes of any kind whatsoever. Obviously, and that's that you you came to shed that view, and indeed your faith altogether. Obviously, uh, Peter feels that, that there's enough there. At a, if you like, secular historical standard that, that gives him cause to trust that Let the, me just say, the, the faith can, beliefs are. Yes, can I just say about seriously. that? I mean, yeah. the, the point he keeps coming back to is the one we talked about earlier, and people need to pay attention to that. Is if somebody gets the geography right, does that mean the stories are true? But the second thing I'll say is that. <sighs> I don't know if we're finishing up. We are finishing up now. This, why not use this as your as your final thoughts as as we start to wrap this all up? All right. But. So, um, I think there are different reasons that people engage in this kind of scholarship on the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, most very firm believers are interested in the subject because they want to be confirmed in their beliefs. They think something; they're just convinced it's true, and they want to hear somebody who gives them some reason to think. Or they may have right. run into a Bart Ehrman who's caused them to, to doubt some of yeah, their beliefs. Yeah, they might. Yeah. And, but they want to know why he's mm. wrong and why they're right. Okay. So that's called confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. And we all have it. Mm. We, we agree with the people that agree with us. Even We don't care whether the, it's a plausible argument. You just want to agree with somebody who's mm. like smart and he says this <laughs> and my like, God, that guy's smart. I'm going to believe it too. So that's how I was for my early life. Absolutely. I studied apologetics. I studied the Bible. The reason I went in the first place was to confirm what I believed so I could convince other people and convert, convert them to faith in Jesus. That's why I was doing it. The other reason to do this kind of study is to decide what you think is right rather than simply confirm that you're already right. And that means having an open mind to possibly changing. It is very difficult and emotionally stressful to change what you believe about something as fundamental as who Jesus is mm -hmm. and what the Bible is. Um, it is highly traumatic. Most people who approach scholarship on the Bible simply aren't willing to do it because they don't, they don't want to be proved wrong. And they aren't going to believe someone else, but they might believe themselves when they find out, actually, I was wrong about this. When I went through this, I just, at one point in my life, I finally just said, look, I'm just going to go wherever I think the truth leads me because Augustine said that, uh, paraphrase, all truth is God's truth. If it's true, it comes from God, and so you shouldn't be afraid of it. It may cause emotional trouble, but you shouldn't be afraid of the truth. And I was willing to change my mind if it went that way. And I just think people ought mm -hmm. to do that. I think it's better to see what the evidence is rather than simply find things that confirm what you've thought since you were 14 years old. Okay, final thoughts, Peter. Well, enjoyed our conversation. I suppose what I would say is, uh, in my own experience, you know, wor working uh, in scholarship, not as long as Bart, but for still for, you know, a few decades, Easy. Is, that, <laughs> <laughs> is, is that I have found that, you know, I'm, I'm at a stage where perhaps I'm just very, very guilty of confirmation bias, but I think I'm, I'm finding more and more reasons to uh, believe uh, and I see a convergence of things on the person of Jesus. We haven't talked a lot about the miraculous, but you know, um, this guy who just happens to to die in the capital of this, you know, by the capital of this remarkable people group, uh, the Jews, in ways that seem to fit with books that have been written beforehand uh, in prophecy, and that you know uh, happens to die around Passover time. All these sort of things come together, plus happens to be the first guy credited with the golden rule plus happens to you know the book you said he's not uh, the, the positive golden rule sorry no no in your footnote you said he's not 
You pointed to a Chinese scholar 200 years earlier. That, I said, think that's negative. No, 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 it's positive. Well, I'll look at my book again. <laughs> uh, um, you know, there yeah, are all yeah. these things that are just remarkable in terms of the stories credited to Jesus. And so I think there's a pattern um, of, of convergence uh, of things that tell you, yes, this is a, a person who can be trusted and books about him that, that can be trusted. So, you know, I'm very positive, but, uh, you know, I'm very delighted to have this engagement. Thank you both. Okay, thank it's you. It's been yes. great to have you both. Shall we shake hands as well? Shake Absolutely. Hands. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank you both, Bart great. and Peter, for being with me on the show today. Great. Thank you. For more debates, updates, and bonus content, sign up at thebigconversation.show.